It all began on March 31, 2019, when 12,000 protesters came down the roads of Hong Kong protesting the extradition bill. And by July, this number was 270,000. Clashes, tensions, police barricades, arrest, and even death. Hong Kong, a gorgeous city, seems to have been caught amidst a turmoil ever since the protests have erupted. Apparently, the prime cause is indeed the implementation of the controversial bill. But the protests also have other concerns, which include its strained relationship with China. Protesters demand for a democratic reforms and look forward to a higher level of autonomy. The protest mimicked the 1967 skirmishes. The escalating violent street protest impersonated the riots that had erupted back in 1967. Amidst the hullabaloo, it is quite amusing that Beijing considers itself the colonial frontrunner, and the main target of turbulence this time is a clear arraignment of its slant to governing the lands of Hong Kong. It is also an indication of a major flaw in the transfer of sovereignty of Hong Kong to China as it ended its 156 years of colonial rule in Hong Kong in 1997. For the Hong Kongers, the agreement that was made between Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping and the then British Prime Minister of 1984 Margaret Thatcher was that people of Hong Kong would continue to live their life as it is even after 1997. What was the 1997 arrangement? The 1997 arrangement said, one country, two systems, and that there wouldn't be any communist annexation, subdued transfer of sovereignty, and protection of basic freedom rights for the next 50 years. Deng Xiaoping had then said that mainland China may gradually espouse a liberal capitalist system so Taiwan and Hong Kong would slowly and flawlessly merge in with the motherland. Commemorating 1984, China was almost at its peak to becoming open-minded. However, things did not go accordingly, and the change was brought down to its knees pitilessly with the June 4th incident, or what the world better remembers as Tiananmen Square protest of 1989. Thousands were killed, and thousands more were injured. Political liberalization was nowhere in the scene, although there were delayed economic reforms that took place. Intentions of Beijing All was lost when Xi Jinping became the Chinese president in 2012. Jinping was a dictatorial, and soon took to governing China is a totalitarian form. This made the position of Hong Kong fragile and questionable. Hong Kong is a place where capital flows liberally, people have freedom to speech, and there is judicial impartiality. To Jinping, Hong Kong was a hurdle to his vision of transformation. Beijing doesn't seem to have kept their word on leaving the economic structure of Hong Kong untouched. It has in fact farmed out the control of Hong Kong to a small group of oligarchs that are dominating the local economy. Is Hong Kong really a free economy? The Heritage Foundation of America for the 25th time named Hong Kong the freest economy once again in 2019 this year. However, every year when the declaration is made, it prompts disdain from the ones that actually have tried to start a company that could impinge the business of the already business tycoons of Hong Kong. The riches of Hong Kong are the ones that deal in the real estate and property. Hong Kong has the world's most expensive real estate market. The average salary of a person working in Hong Kong is almost equivalent to the price of one bedroom flat here. The exorbitant rents for houses, inequality at its prodigality, and inflow of visitors from China are all causes of the protest that have been continuing despite the extradition bill being formally withdrawn. 
Around 1 million people of the total 7.4 million population of Hong Kong are people that have come from China recently. When the handover of Hong Kong took place in 1997, Beijing diligently flattered the rich business families by liberally giving them entry to land and investments in China so they could have their allegiance. The business families, in turn, were expected to keep the influential and common population of the city inert. A salient thing about the current uproar is that none of Hong Kong's garrulous moguls are publicly visible. Irrespective of the fact where their compassions lie, it is obvious that they cannot anger the ones in Beijing that have given them abundantly, nor can they rage the common people of Hong Kong because of who they are enjoying the immense riches. Before the handover of Hong Kong, Beijing had also made associations with triad organized group of criminals that were mounting in the Hong Kong societies and were asked to remain patriotic to them if they wanted to exist peacefully. This insalubrious history has made the people into believing that the triads have been attacking the protesters and that Beijing was stimulating them to do so. What is the future of Hong Kong? Given the recent protests, the question that comes up is how workable is the one country two systems framework between China and Hong Kong, and would this arrangement last till 2047 as originally envisioned during the handover of 1947? It is uncertain whether the arrangement that subsists currently was actually the one anticipated back in the handover of 1997. It was always a very non-figurative and malleable system which permitted Hong Kong autonomy at a very high level where it could preserve its capitalist system. Although in 1997, this was sketchly Beijing's concern to preserve. While People's Republic has continued the one-party rule and has emerged as one of the world's most powerful economies, Hong Kong has moderated in significance, upholding some facade to one country two systems framework. Hong Kong has been gnawed and conceded, all cleverly done in a concealed way that has made her frail and infirm. It is rather sad to see Hong Kong diminish sluggishly. What the future holds for Hong Kong is blurred. Do their people get what they want or does Beijing overpower her is something that future will unfold with time to come.